Designers in Film, presented by Mike Dempsey. For me, it was the set of Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, designed by Ken Adam in 1964, that has had a lasting impact on my memory. The vast constructivist influence Warham set with its extreme triangular shape and central oval table illuminated by an elegantly suspended light ring described by Steven Spielberg as the greatest set in cinema history is masterful. So it was a great privilege for me to have had the opportunity of interviewing Ken Adam just a few years before his death. When newly elected President Reagan was being given a guided tour of the Pentagon, he asked to be shown the war room and was disappointed to be told that it didn't exist. The set for that film, along with 75 others spanning a 60-year career, including seven Bond films, The Ipcrest File, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and the Oscar-winning duo Barry Lyndon and The Madness of King George, both the set design, were the vision of my guest today. Ken Adam is the doyen of 20th century film set design. His work has inspired countless designers and architects around the world, and his life is every bit as glamorous as the films he has designed. His family fled the Nazis from their home in Germany, and once settled in the UK, Ken Adam, along with his brother, were the first Germans to be allowed into the RAF, where they flew typhoons in the Second World War. He is also a lover of fast cars and exotic locations and has been responsible for some of the biggest and most expensive sets ever built. I spoke to him about his life and work at his home in London's Knightsbridge. I want to, um, to start, Ken, with really your early sort of inspiration. I think it was the cabinet of Dr Caligari right. with those extraordinary expressionist sets by Herman Warm, I think it right. was, that really inspired you onto your career path. Why, why was it so influential? I don't know, because I was at that time never quite sure whether I would go for the theater design or for film design. And I felt Caligari gave me a, a sort of interesting compromise because these uh, it was designed by a number of expressionist artists, very stylized, very theatrical, and I said, well, you know, I was very young when I saw it. I was, I think, 13 or 14 years old. You know, I, I loved it. I loved the combination of the theatrical, uh, theatricality and uh, realism. And I saw it when I came to England. I didn't ah, see so it. Yeah, yeah. So it was after you came over yeah, to England. Yeah. You were 12 when you came over. 13. 13. Yeah. yeah. So you saw it at that time yeah, here. Yeah. I saw it, and, and I also saw uh, Metropolis. Of course. Yeah. 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 Yes, which yes. impressed me. You yes. know. So I was very fortunate because in, in, in Berlin I was not allowed by my parents to go to the cinema. The only, I was allowed to see Schiller or plays the and so on. Yeah, yes. yeah. But uh, the only film I ever saw was a film called Shang. I never forgot it. It was a nature film in which there was a horrendous battle between a python and a tiger and I've ne never forgotten it all my life. <laughs> Of course, you you came here mm. to uh, escape Germany and, and, mm. and the Nazi regime, and then later, of course, you, you joined the RAF along with your brother, Dennis. I think I'm right in saying that you were the only Germans accepted into the RAF at, th at that time. I think, yes, um, I think so. Mm. And went on to fly yes. typhoons. Yes. And I, I saw think. a very lovely drawing of your typhoon that you have reproduced really? in the book, mm. um, the, the Christopher Freling book, which yeah. is... Which clearly was showing your artistry at that time, yeah, very detailed. Yeah, yeah. As we've got so much to squeeze into the little time that we have, I, I'm, I'm going to select a few of your many films, mm -hmm. specifically because they, they have a, a resonance, I think, with, with a wider audience. And I mm -hmm. think I, I have to start with Dr. Strangelove. I think that that's yes. got to be... Yeah. What I'm interested in, apart from the fact that that set, the War Room set particularly, which I know Steven Spielberg has rated as the, the best mm -hmm. piece of cinema production design ever, in his view. I'm interested in the relationship between director and production designer, because it seems to me that you know when a film is 
in its early stages, you know, the production designer, particularly, and the director. I mean, if we put the writer to one side for the moment, but that it, that really is the visualization process of the yes. film. Yes. Yes. And so, I'd be very interested in how you first met Kubrick. Yeah. How did well, that come about? Kubrick phoned me. He had just arrived in uh, London. He was staying, I think, at the Westbury Hotel. And he had seen Dr. No, and he was really uh, impressed by Dr. No, so he asked me to come and see him. And we hit it off. His, the first impression was it's somebody w with enormous vitality and so on, but rather naive, which is all, which is not true, <laughs> you know. And we got on a uh, house on fire, but then eventually you found out this enormous brain, computer brain almost, that he had. But at the same time, uh, incredible enthusiasm. So when he more or less explained what he was going to do, I was doodling some ideas. And he was so impressed with the doodles. He said, that's it, that's the war room, you see. So I said to myself, well, you know, this great director who everybody's so scared of, easy, <laughs> Little did I know, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, you, of course, that was the, the focal point of that film, the huge light ring yeah. and the, the table, yeah. uh, with the circular table with, with the president and everyone uh, surrounding them, in, yeah. it, with those dramatic, sort of triangular, exaggerated perspectives, with all of the... Um, yeah with the, um, well, the whole that. world there to, yeah. to, to see. And, and, and I know that uh, I think President Reagan actually thought it existed yes. when he was being shown around <laughs> the Pentagon. He wanted to see that. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's obviously stuck in the mind of so many people that have seen that film. The areas that I of that film that I also find, because I actually went last year to BFI during the Kubrick season, and yeah. I, they had a good, very good print, Strange Love, and so I was yeah. able to look at it in close quarters. And, of course... The thing that I was amazed by is that you you actually recreated all of those interiors of the of the B fifty two bombers, and because of the nature of the way they were shot, which mm -hmm. is sort of semi documentary style, right. which seemed to be which is very interesting because yeah. that seems to occur later in the film when the base is being attacked. It's right, handheld yeah. cameras yeah. really yeah. very yeah. much which, like uh, which Kubrick shot, you know, himself. Yes. Yeah, it had that. For, but likewise, in inside the the cockpit, I, I thought it was actually inside the real. Right. You, you meticulously put those together without having... Well, it was on the secret list. Exactly. Yeah. So how yeah. did you... How did that... Well, we found a lot of information in Jane's oh, yes. aircraft or whatever it was. I also had a fantastic assistant art director who was called Peter Merton, who unfortunately died uh, two months ago. He was brilliant at sort of researching things and finding old panels and or switches and so on. We decided to go for 100% realism on, on the B-52, and uh, it was very funny when some American Air Force personnel visited us at some stage at Shepparton, and they, they went white, you know, how did we know all this? And I got a, a memo from Kubrick, I hope I know where where I got it from because we might be investigated by the CIA. And it is the interest, I think, exactly what you were talking about, that you got the war room, which is mm. complete fabrication yes. and so on. And had and a surreal quality. A completely totally surreal, surreal quality. And why I think it was one of my mo uh, most successful sets, because... It fitted so well the um, dramatic uh, impact of the scenes mm. and all the actors felt completely at home but in a strange way, yes. you know. Yes. So it was a set which really mirrored what Kubrick had in mind mm. or what the film had in mind. Mm. In that sense, I think it was one of the best sets I ever designed. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I started off with a different design which, while we were doodling. Mm. And, and Kubrick liked that for about three weeks, and I drove him every day to the studio. And one day he said, Ken, I don't know what to do with the second level, because I had two levels, rather like, a little bit like an amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, Stanley, you're the director, you know. He said, well, I don't know what to do with the second level, so we'll come up with something else. And I really f nearly flipped out and went for a walk in Shepparton Gardens, you know, in the mm -hmm. studio, and and then came back and after taking a volume or something like that, 
and start the scribbling again. And he was standing behind when he saw this triangular shape that, well, the triangle is the strongest geometric form, isn't it? I said, yes, certainly. And he said, well, how are you going to treat the surfaces? I said, that's a reinforced concrete. So like a gigantic bombshell. So, yes, and that's how really I see the whole and thing. And in, interestingly, looking at that set, mm. it does have echoes of the Caligari, some of the Caligari, yes, you know, yeah, that yeah, dramatic, yeah, um, yeah. exaggerated perspective. Yeah, it, yeah. It, Expressionist. It, yeah, of of course, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get close to the actors at all, or was that... Because obviously Sellers was such an important part yes, of Yes, I'd project. known him before, uh, Peter, socially. And uh, mind you, one never got very close to mm. Pete, but we were friends. So Peter I knew very well, and George C. Scott I got to know, and Sterling Hayden as yes. General Ripper. I got really close to Terry Southern, who oh, was yes, the writer. Uh, the writer. Yes, it yes. was quite crazy, but yes. fantastic. And I never forgot... The first time he came on the war room, and I said to him, well, what do you think of it? He said, well, looks interesting, but will it dress? You know? <laughs> I mean, it's sort of completely idiotic. Like I said, there, that's all it. you're going to have. <laughs> no. But he always used to, I mean, he knew he was saying something. He was antagonizing. <laughs> I, I know that. The, that collaboration was it had its stresses and strains, but yeah. it was a, clearly a landmark piece of work. And later, you were offered to work on two thousand one, but you turned it down because Kubrick had been secretly talking to NASA. Yeah, not secret. He had um, advisors, really. So working. why did that? Ups- did that? That obviously. Well, I work? tell you because I felt I have to know as much about space and subject matter as he does but go only in that case I can assert myself mm-hmm. or my ideas rather because I can argue with him mm-hmm. but if he knows so much more than I do about space technology and so on mm. I, uh, he will destroy me in a yes. way so it puts you at a great disadvantage yeah. I mean he it seemed to me, from what I read about him, he seemed to rather could be a rather secretive fellow and yes. wanting to yeah. share yeah. his thoughts, even though it would have been probably very beneficial to, you know, share the ideas. Yes, that maybe but I think in, in in his whole certainly professional life, he mm. was very secretive. Yeah. You know, he used to uh, never go with the second unit on various films. No, and a little later, I want to talk to you about another film. Yeah. Right, but <laughs> but I want to move on to. One of my personal favourite films that uh-huh. uh, you designed, which is The Ipcrest File, oh, in yes. 1965, mm-hmm. I particularly like yeah, yeah. because I think um, it seemed to me that you know there was a, a period, a prolonged period, post-war period, where everything was rather dowdy and sort of drab, and this film came along, which was sort of antidote to Bond, really. Bond was much more glamorous and fantasy, whereas yeah. this was rooted in a kind of reality, and I know mm-hmm. that uh, Len Dayton himself worked in that area right. as a translator, I think, so yeah. he knew that world very well. But what I was interested in is the opening sequence of the film in which uh, Michael Caine is he's, he's getting up and he oh, goes yeah. into his kitchen, which yeah. is a very trendy kitchen. I yeah. mean, it looks as good now, in fact, because there's been a re- 60s revival, you know, the low-level lighting and so yeah. forth. It looks terrific. Everything else in the film was yeah. very grim. Yeah. And uh, I thought that that really introduced the character, that he was a young guy, he could cook, the lighting was beautiful, mm. the interior was beautiful. And yet, of course, you then had to reintroduce all of these other areas for the, you know, where he worked and the sort of rather austere, colourless yeah. rooms. I mean, that was a big contrast. I know that you've worked on many productions, obviously with different characters, mm. but this this seemed to me to be almost a kind of, as I say, antidote to Bond. You know, yes, you it was. I the mean, minimum rather, yeah. rather than the maximum. Yes, Harry Saltzman never saw it, certainly initially as that way, but he thought it, saw it as a really poor man's Bond, and we were very much against it. Sid Fury, myself, mm. and... Uh, producer from New York called Charlie Casher, and we fought Harry all the time about it, and um, it was, I think, Michael's second film or third film and Mm. so on, and he was on our side all the time, and the kitchen 
was also, also part of uh, Len Dayton, who mm. was also interested. So I designed that kitchen inside the existing, I think, uh, building and uh, made Michael a little bit of the Len Dayton character yes. with his cooking at the because end. He, because Dayton was writing the cookery, he was yes. cookery yeah, uh, yeah. Um, strips, I think, in uh, Observer or the yeah, Right. Yeah. And also he went on to write cookery books as well yeah, as obviously yeah, the, the yeah. hip crest part. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we always had to fight Harry mm. on this not making it a poor man's bond. And I will never, maybe it's too long the secret, but I found this house in Grosvenor Place and it was uh, Victorian or um, Edwardian and big house and had one very big room with three windows at the end, beautiful proportion. And um, I decided to use it with for M's office. Oh, it wasn't M, it was Yes, M, I've, I've forgotten his yeah, name, yeah, but yeah, I know yeah, what you yeah. mean. Yeah. And um, Harry was also impressed by it. He said, can any dressing you want, computers, any modern equipment, I can get it for you. And I thought about it during the night, and I thought uh, to to show this disciplinarian who mm -hmm. was running, and all that, it would be much better to have it empty, have a trestle table as its desk, mm -hmm. and uh, a camp bed on the side, mm -hmm. and um, maybe a bust of the Duke of Wellington or Caesar. And Harry came, and and I, I sold the idea to Sid Fury. He, and he loved it. And uh, while we were shooting, Harry came on the set and he blew his top only as Harry could do. And he said, I was trying to go between him and the director and this is all that sort of thing. And you know, film units love these sort of rows. They all disappeared all over the place. And then about two hours later, Harry came back and said, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> But it was that sort of film. Yes. And it was great because we had a wonderful old cameraman who uh, started his career by filming the uh, funeral of the Emperor Fritz Joseph, you know, on a handheld camera. Oh, really? He was more uh, for Otto Heller. Mm -hmm. And uh, his operator was very good. Too. There were some very good compositions. Yes, yeah, very good compositions. Very unusual. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, seemed to. Yeah hit the note of the time. Absolutely. It, it somehow all worked. It did. Yeah, it did, yeah, it did yeah, work. Yeah. It, it stands up very well. Yeah. After you said, actually, I think that you wouldn't work with Kubrick again, you actually were persuaded to go back in 75 and, and this time to work on Barry Lyndon, right. which again, uh, I'd, I'd seen uh, last year at BAFTA, mm. new print, mm. and you know, was astonished by its beauty. Yeah. Still, yeah. wonderful film. And the interesting thing about that, I think, is that you t talked a little earlier about the fact that Kubrick would never go on second unit. In fact, he didn't leave the country, did no, he? He stayed no. very much rooted yeah. here. And you found yourself in a position of, of actually making rather more decisions, probably, than, yeah, right. than, than you would normally yeah, be expected yeah, to. Yeah. Even, I think, d did you direct any of the second unit? Yourself? No. no. No, I think I may have done one sequence mm -hmm. because in, of a house in Ireland, which he thought was haunted, and so he didn't want to be near him, nor did he want his two daughters to be anywhere near him. It was just an establishing shot or mm. something like that. But, I mean, if I talk about Barry Lyndon, it'll take us till tomorrow no, morning. I, I, <laughs> no, I think, you know, it, it's a, a magnificent film visually. Mm. And again, looking at it last year, it is just, I mean, certainly, you know, the fact that so much of those interior shots were lit by only by candlelight light, light, yeah. and that lenses were developed, yeah, yeah. fast lenses to, yeah. to be able to capture that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure for, for, for um, production designer that had its own, and a, and a DP, its mm -hmm. own problems. Yeah, uh, enormous dealing problems. Dealing with yeah. that. Yeah, we were all talking in terms of candle power. Yes. <laughs> because <laughs> we used to import candle, treble wick or double wick, you see, depending... One didn't realize the trouble it caused, particular, since Stanley wanted to shoot everything on, mm. in location interiors, you know, and on location. And the heat given off by these candles was enormous, so 
and some of the stately homes we had tried to design heat shields yeah. out of mm. aluminium and so on today. Because the fire has it, yeah, I guess, yeah, as well, yes. Yeah. And that, you know, with the beautiful paintings mm. on the wall and so on. So it created uh, enormous problems, but uh, it was a wonderful uh, yeah. idea. And I must say that for Stanley, he always came up with an original a brilliant idea on every film he mm. made, you know. And of course, you you received an uh, an academy yes, for for, yes. for that film mm -hmm. um, for production design. Mm -hmm. So it was worth you <laughs> hooking Almost. up with it again. <laughs> but uh, the interesting thing about it is that I find there is another film that was made just a few years later in 1979, which is remarkably similar in feel, and that is Ridley Scott's first film, The Duelists. Um, Have you ever seen no, that film? No. Well, I, I watched. Mm. I actually designed the title for the Julius. Oh, really? I, watching Barry Lyndon last year, and I hadn't seen it for, for a long, long time. Oh. And then rewatching the Julius, the similarities are remarkable. The opening. Oh yes, the opening I now shot remember. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. Opening shot yeah. is a duel. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's ca lots of candlelit scenes yeah, exactly. and yeah. lots of beautiful interiors. Yeah. So I think that um, it's clear that Ridley Scott was very taken yeah, by yeah. the beauty of that yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. I want to move on now to the most remarkable body build, which is all the innovative design work you've done on the, on the seven Bond films. We, obviously, we can't talk about them all, but, uh, I mean, they became more and more ambitious. You know, you, right. you had the spectacular missile launching pad mm -hmm. hidden inside a volcano mm. in You Only Live Twice, which I think was the biggest set ever built. Ever built yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, which, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, And then, of course, you had the Pyramid Room in Moonraker, which was right. another yeah. uh, epic. I, I would have thought that dealing with that sheer size of production must have given you an, an enormous uh, stress at times. I know yes. that on Linden you were under enormous yes, stress. Yes, enormous stress, stress and I, I had a bro breakdown actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, there are so many other reasons for that, but I was under stress mm. on, certainly on those ones mm. like you only live twice mm. and uh, the later one. But you have to remember I had a fantastic team with mm. me by this time. You know, we were a great family, and they were all good. Mm -hmm. And my construction manager, Ronnie Udell, was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he made that famous statement to a journalist of the Observer when they came to Bynemoor. And the, the journalist asked uh, Ronnie, how is it you can build all these things that this man uh, designed? And he said, quite angrily, anything he can draw, I can build. And that became, you know, a class. but it was true, too. Yeah. You know. Well, that's one, wonderful when you have that kind of yes, collaboration. Yes, a great team. It's, yeah, it's, it's, great team. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I mean, it makes life so much easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you trained as an architect. Didn't yes, you, the, yes. The, the but not the full training. No, no. no, no. But I think uh, you, again, one of the architects you admired uh, a lot was Eric Mendelssohn. That's right. The modernist yeah, architect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, in fact, a couple of years ago, I was working for the Weizmann Science Institute, which is just out of Tel Aviv, and mm. um, Mendelssohn built the house for Heim Weizmann, really? so I visited that house and saw oh, that. Incredible. And then, of course, here in this country, they they recently renovated the Delaware uh, at Betsilon C, yeah. which is uh, Scher Schermeyer yeah, and, uh, and uh, Mendelssohn. But it's also, it was interesting because, you know, I was also articled with a firm of architects and engineers, mm -hmm. C.W. Glover and partners. And one of the junior uh, bosses was a man called Quine Lay. And he had been uh, associated with Mendelssohn. So even though I was studying at the time as an external student at the Bartlett School, which mm -hmm. was very t traditional in those days, mm -hmm. And I was going, you know, through hell. Mm. But Quine Lay always pushed Push. me, you know. And I think the professors, even like Richards, you know, then became president of there, were like talking to me because they spent more time with me in the evenings, you see. I grew up in that sort of environment. And I also, in some of my spare time did some working drawings for all sort of drafting for a group called the Maths Group, which were a splinter group mm -hmm. of uh, the Bauhaus mm -hmm. in England. Yeah. And so I came very much in touch with uh, 
the modernistic mm. uh, ideas mm. and, and architecture, even though in hindsight, something that occurred to me again because I saw the Bauhaus exhibition in Berlin mm. and it's now at the MoMA in New York mm. and it's fantastic mm. if you ever get a chance to see it. But it didn't go down too well in England. I mean, when these architects from the Bauhaus came here, and I remember one designed a private house in Frohnow in Hampstead, mm -hmm. and it got, didn't get great reviews and so on. And they finally all ended up, in, or most of them ended up, in the United States. Mm. It was a strange thing. I want to move on to the other kind of passion that you've had over the years, which is motor cars. I mean, yes. your Rolls Royce <laughs> is sitting outside there, beautiful as it is, mm -hmm. and. Um, of course, you, one has to talk about the Aston Martin uh, DB5 that yeah. was used in the Bond films. And, mm -hmm. and it was you that, of course, designed the ejector seat and the scythe and the machine mm -hmm. guns. And from what I understand, all of those things worked. Yes, they did work. They all worked. Yeah, but that wasn't me. No. We had a wonderful uh, special effects uh, engineer, Johnny Steers at that time, mm -hmm. uh, who anything I, I came up with, he went better on, you mm -hmm. know. Obviously, you couldn't have real machine guns and so no, on, but no, you know, no. it was, yeah. uh, he, he was brilliant. And I was very fortunate with him, and then later on with Derek Meddings, who mm -hmm. also was a brilliant special effects director and model maker and so on. So I was very lucky that eventually I had a fantastic team yeah. with me, and I felt nothing was impossible. impossible. And they were too proud to admit that some things maybe were not <laughs> quite that possible. You, of course, the other car that you designed is the, the right. car in Chitty yeah. Chitty Bang Bang, which you've, you've referred to as that bloody car. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I tell you, it, um, I found in those days very easy to design futuristic uh, vehicles of any description. And I thought anything... Uh, and suddenly to find myself designing something of the turn of the century that time you know, and make it look sexy and interesting, I found very difficult. And I kept doing sketches after sketches. And then we built an actually full-size mock-up at Pinewood. And uh, I say recently, and it must be now 15 or 20 years ago, I met someone in, in, in Canada who mm -hmm. was working for me as a carpenter. And he said, you, Ken, you have no idea. You drove all of us crazy with your changes and so on and so on until I felt I got it right. And then it was built by Alan Mann, who had a racing stable, and uh, uh, Ford put up the uh, chassis and uh, mm -hmm. uh, engine and so on. But uh, you have no idea how much correspondence I still get on J.D. Bang Bang. Well, I guess because, of course, it's now a very successful musical and yes, um, touring yeah. the world, and mm. I suppose it re you know, it's, it's created a great interest mm -hmm. in, in, in that, and the car is yeah. iconic. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I remember at the time of the film, they made models of the car, yeah, too, right. yeah, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, it's mm. stuck in people's mind. And, and of course, in the theater, in the theater production, it actually is flying over the audience, over the audience yeah, yeah, which yeah, is um, yeah, yeah, yeah. quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A big shift for you was being approached in 2003 to work on a computer game, GoldenEye. Yeah. I, I'm not a games person myself, but mm -hmm. I did look through many of the images on the game itself and the, the sets that um, that you've designed. In the same way. And obviously I, I think that, and, and this was you know, the, the whole computer gaming uh, world is advanced enormously. It, it, it advances, you know, rapidly yeah, year on year. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, 2003, I mean, the renderings then were, uh, were not as good as yeah. uh, they were now. But I, I think what I'd like to talk to you about is something we touched on just before we started the interview. Mm -hmm. Is is the 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 idea of creating a complete world mm. rather than you know sets where cameras will be in a specific position and you know what you've got to cover, mm. but in computer games, it's a different thing altogether. Yes, Do you want altogether. to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, this computer game, I think, was uh, dealing with Goldfinger or something. I, think, I can't even remember the name of it, but it it's had... GoldenEye. Yeah, GoldenEye. Mm. And uh, they came up 
with, you know, design for Fort Knox based on my sketches and so on. Mm -hmm. Then I found out that when I did, you know, sent them my renderings for the new Fort Knox, that I had to deal with things which I didn't do with the film because in a computer game people have to hide, they fight, they go behind things through corridors or passages and so on which was completely new to me. Mm. But I, I didn't mind that so much. But I was so disappointed when they sent me the uh, first DVDs over of what they had shot. I couldn't see the gold, you see. And I said, what's happened? You know, I stacked up gold like a cathedral inside the cathedral, 40 foot high. Now I see crates with sort of bits of gold glowing. He said, Ken, because we can't yet get the reflective surfaces of gold. Those days are good. Now they can. Absolutely, you know, yes. Yeah. yes. I, they, they've made an enormous advance yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. what can be yeah. done. And well, Every day. I think, uh, yeah. you know, on that topic, of course, you know, we've got the Oscars coming up this weekend, and yeah. no doubt Avatar will pick up quite a lot of awards, I should think, yeah. which is now the advance. I haven't seen the film, but um, it's 3D. Um, computer-generated imagery, most of the film, with yeah. live action as well. Yeah. What's your view on... The, because, obviously, CGI is something you probably em embraced here with this game, mm -hmm. but not in your film world so much. Everything was no. built. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, it, everything was well, built I started a yeah, very limited uh, use of CGI on, on The Madness of King George for mm -hmm. Windsor Castle mm -hmm. and one or two films before then. I can't think of them now. But... Um, I think it's a fantastic tool, it's a fantastic tool. but I think it can be overused mm -hmm. because, uh, and also the production designer really has less control because even though you can sketch out every sequence and set up sketches or continuity sketches, normally you are not kept on after principal photography and so it's left to all these various CGI companies yes. who do it. And um, I must one day talk to, to Stuart Craig about it, you know, yes, that, yes, because he's very much involved in that. But uh, I found every time I used it, the director three months later called me and said, you better look at these CGI because I can't, they're terrible and so on. And even so, I sketched it out and given them mm. the they came up with some different yes. ideas, yes. you see. But, you know, every day the most incredible progress is made. Mm. But the danger is that a film relies too much on this new mm. invention or new tool. And I always think that when a director or a designer or anybody was limited, he had to use more his imagination very mm. often to come up to give the impression of 100,000 people uh, attacking. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, something yes, like that. of course. And nowadays it's so simple. It's, you know, you know. They just <laughs> well, I don't want to discuss no. uh, Avatar because no, uh, the Oscars of course. are not No, no. Uh, there, there, uh, are, mm. there is another film out that's just been released called The Road where, from what I understand, no CGI has been used. No, but there's that, some yeah. fantastic sequences which yeah. are yeah. just brilliant. Yeah. And you would think that it is CGI. So yeah. it, it can be done, and it was yeah. made on a far smaller yeah. budget, yeah. obviously, yeah. Than, yeah. Uh, than that. So do you think that computer games is an area that you would be, you'd be happy to work in again? I don't know. Um, I mean, I was surrounded... Uh, uh, with electronic arts and I went still to LA by a lot of young mm. very enthusiastic people and mm. they have formed into teams and each team works on something and I was quite excited uh, that they you know respected and admired my work mm. because I used to send it on an old fax you know my <laughs> sketches and so on and but if, if it's funny you should mention it because I had a phone call uh, last night or the night before mm. of uh, somebody who was in charge at Electronics Arts who then left me. And nobody that I worked with is still there mm. because the hours are so incredible mm. and, and they have no restriction. 
and he's working for Disney and has been working for Disney for some time. He asked me, would I be interested to come up? He thinks for some space ideas and so on. I don't know. Mm. Uh, well, well, it's, <laughs> that's good. Um, I think the last film you completed was the Out of Towners, which is, is that right? Yes, about yeah, eleven that, years ago. Yeah, it was was not the last film I did, but yeah. but no, I did one called Taking Sides ah, after that. Yes, yes, in Berlin. Right. Okay. Uh, was the uh, Ron Harwood uh, uh, about the uh, denazification of Fort Wengler, the conduct uh, in uh, in uh, 1945, I think mm -hmm. it was. And Ishman Zabu, the Hungarian director, directed it in uh, at the Ufa Studios in Berlin, and he was, I designed it. And uh, actually, it's a very good film, mm. but it came out, unfortunately, was shown at the Toronto Film Festival at 10 11, the day after the disaster of 9 11. Oh, I see. Day, and everybody. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I know that you, you also designed the feature of the Berlin Millennium Pavilion, which was the, the, the futuristic structure. Yes. That, yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and you ran into difficulties there, I think, because one, you had a, there was a date that it had to hit. But you, you'd come up against something you hadn't come up against before, which I think was things like health and safety and planning. Right. And right. planning yeah. <laughs> issues, whereas yeah. with all your Bond films, yeah. you could just build and right. no one's going to... You're absolutely change. right. I don't <laughs> know where you found this out, but uh, it <laughs> so was a big problem. Yeah. How did you um, deal with that? Because well, again, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, those things can be very tricky. Yeah, very tricky. And uh, particularly also in Germany with the... The pedantry of uh, of everything, the elevator had to be, and oh my God, and the glass gantries and and, and so on. But um, we won through somehow, <laughs> you know, and uh, I quite enjoyed it because it was a scientific, uh, really, exhibition in the Martin Gropius Bau, which mm -hmm. is Victorian, and I tried to keep the. Victorian feeling in, in, in the background and then came up with a very modern 70-foot high structure and steel and so on and building, because I knew nothing really, but various uh, like brains and... The spiral. Yeah, well, what is it called? The oh, DNA. The DNA, of yeah, course. The yes, DNA. the double helix. Yes, the yes. double helix. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm 70 foot high wow. out of steel, yeah. you see. And it started off with a diameter like that and then came to an almost nothing. Yeah. And I had some brilliant young sculptor and, and the outskirts of Berlin who did it for me. Wow. So it, it, it was, in a way, a very successful... Mm exhibition and I was forced to exaggerate things because I didn't know enough about science mm. but so do it oversized mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. so that the public were really standing like that when they saw it. Mm. Yeah. Clearly over the, the, the years that you've been designing you've had a, an influence over you know generations of designers in different disciplines and uh, for example Norman Foster the yes. architect yeah. He has said that he based his Canary Wharf underground station, really, which is inspired by your Atlanta set from The, the Spy Who Loved Me. Mm -hmm. And I can also see echoes of your work in younger designers like Mark Newsom and Ross Lovegrove, mm -hmm. and in particularly Desire Hadid, the architect, whose, uh -huh. whose work, and Daniel uh, Liebskin as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh. All of those, when I look at, um, at their pieces, I see always the sets of Bond or, <laughs> or Strange Love. Mm. But I think it seemed to me, looking back at the time of, the, the, of all those classic Bond sets, I, I kind of get the impression that your work was rather overlooked by maybe the, the, the architectural fraternity. And that is yes, I don't think, yeah. You know, uh, did you see my Serpentine exhibition? I did, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. And it was the first time, really, mm, that, that it was really yeah, an art celebrated. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was because a younger generation of architects in particular time that were, were taking the inspiration from maybe the childhood visions of things that they'd seen, particularly yeah. on films and so forth, and feeding that into their work. And this, this kind of interests me because, you, you know, as with anything in design you have these stylistic shifts you know there's 
there's a time for minimalism and there's a time for maximalism right. and mm. postmodernism and all of those yeah. things. Yeah. And uh, but I think there's something very powerful about being inspired at a young age it stays with you mm. and then later much later in life it starts to bleed out of you and I, right. I that's what I feel about these particular designers I think mm. those images created in your films mm -hmm. uh, you know burnt on their sort of retina and they they come out I particularly think as I have did in, um, uh, uh, in particular in fact I've got a couple of pictures although we can't see them here but I want to show you these yeah. because I think you'll you'll be um, you'll be interested to see mm. so here are a couple of um, here is one this is I did oh yes that's um, I think a wine part of a wine uh, cellar company and this is another this is an interior now this look at this yes yeah yes but you know um, while the exhibition was on a lot of architects came yes. to s talk to me and said what I wear how much I had influenced uh, them or uh, other artists. Yes. And I have, hadn't been aware of that. You yeah. know, I was too much involved with in my... Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. of course. Um, on a f frivolous note, mm -hmm. and this has nothing to do with design, but I think it's a, an amusing story. Mm. Per perhaps you could tell us how you got to go to bed with Barbara Streisand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very funny. Yes, it was... Uh, uh, on a film called The Owl and the Pussycat, you see, and in New York, we did it in New York, and the uh, actor was, who was supposed to, uh, Baba played the oh, hooker, yes. you know, yes, sir. and to pick her up in yes. the street and so on, and he f was ill, and Barbara insisted that uh, I would play the part, and Ray Stark, who was a producer, her brother was the actor, and Ray came to see, he said, you've got to do this, and I said, you must be kidding, you know. And uh, but at the same time, somebody had to pay two thousand dollars to my union in New York. Um, so in the end, I thought, man, also since I knew her, her bra so well, and Ray said it's only, I mean, you're not going to do anything and so on. I did it, but it turned out to be three nights of shooting, you <laughs> see. And uh, the funniest thing was when I rang up uh, my wife Letizia, who was staying at the Stanhope Hotel, and said. I've got to go to bed with uh, Barbara <laughs> while George Siegel is while you are watching uh, from a window next door. So she said, uh, what uh, underwear and socks are you wearing? <laughs> and we had to send the car to the stand-up hotel so that I changed my underwear and socks. But I never went to bed with her. She was the one who had, and my God, the problems we had, the stage had to be cleared and so on. But it was a very, very funny sequence, actually. <laughs> Do you go much to the cinema these days? I see a lot here. Do you get, I suppose you get all of the BAFTA yes, and Oscar yeah, yeah. screeners to, yeah, to watch. Yeah, yeah. What, what's your view of cinema at the, at the moment now? Well, I think, uh, you know, you always get, always get good films. Mm. And uh, just because of what you were saying about CGI's and so on, yes, you're amazed at what can be done. Mm. But you find that a film which may be, I mean, I don't want to quote any actual films, but which is... Uh, uh, a normal film which is well directed and mm. well acted and well staged is just as important or more important, you know. Yeah. So um, technology goes ahead, obviously, but I think it normally is a mistake if a film is purely reflecting technology. Mm. Because, you know, also I worked or grew up with actors, whether yeah. it was Olivier or Noel Coward or. Uh, whoever and uh, Marlon Brando and they were very much influenced by the setting in of which course, they were of course. and the props and well that's so on. a very yeah, interesting yeah. topic because yeah. I interviewed um, Anthony Powell the costume designer yeah. um, some years ago and we were talking about the the fact that the effect that clothes have on an actor and how right. some actors want to inhabit the character through the clothes first, the yeah. shoes, that whatever. Yeah, yeah. But likewise, I think the, the world that you create for them must have an enormous emotional impact right. on their performances. Right, right. So I think it's th these key elements that right. can create the reality of a world. Right. Um, right. So I, I, I can quite understand yeah, actors yeah. being, as you said at the beginning of this interview, with the um, the 
war room, for example, I'm sure that the actors entering that space would feel completely different. Yes, absolutely. Because it was so extraordinary. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Certainly yeah. Sellers yeah. Um, yeah. 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 gave such a wonderful performance, not only as the president, but yeah. as Strangelove, as Strangelove in that yeah. scene yeah. with in the wheelchair. Yeah, the that big problem was for the other actors to keep a straight face. Yeah, I s so I gather, because I believe a lot of that performance was improvised, yeah. which is... Yeah, which yeah. Is yeah. <laughs> yeah. but Peter used to improvise a lot, yes. you know, and because I knew him before Strangelove, and I think it started Kubrick on uh, doing so many takes uh, on future films. Which he was yeah. notorious, yeah. Yeah, right, notorious I but with Peter, you know, you never knew. I mean, he came, I mean it was unbelievable. Yeah. And if you watch Strange Love closely and you see uh, Peter Strange Love and say, you know, yes, my few or something yeah. like that. I can and walk. And yeah, That's I can it. walk. And Peter Bull is standing <laughs> yes, next yes. to him and he can't keep a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that the, the originally that film was going to have a custard pie. Scene, That's right, which yeah. was shot, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and then it was. Yeah, it was removed. Yeah, yeah. well, I think there were v various reasons for it, but um, we all, uh, including Stanley's family, tried to make him use it because mm. it was brilliantly done and so on. And he absolutely also was the time of the assassination of. Uh, uh, J.F. Kennedy, of course, yes. and yes. Uh, there is a line of dialogue, how can you know, our president be struck down, yeah. because it ends with uh, Peter Sellers as the president and uh, Peter Bull as the Russian right. ambassador, sitting like children on the wall well, floor, right, yes. building sandcastles out of the, out of the custard pies, yes. you know. Yes. Yes. And so Stanley thought that uh, it uh, you know, nothing could force him to use it. It ends on a on a, a, a cut and a nuclear yeah, explosion. Yeah. Well, you see, prior to that, I think uh, Slim Pickens uh, riding yeah. the, yeah, the yeah, bomb, bomb, bomb down, yeah. <laughs> which is a very strange, rather sinister shot because of the nature of how it was done. It looked like back projection or whatever, but it's <laughs> suddenly very, very creepy. It had mm. the sort of quality of some of those Hitchcock films where he <laughs> seemed to use really obvious backdrops, but mm -hmm. they seem to have a strange, sinister sense of reality. Yes. Well, I think what happened was that uh, St Stanley came up with this idea. I was always driving him to and from the studio, so I mm -hmm. knew everything that went on. And Peter Sellers just wasn't any good as the bomber captain. Yes, yeah, he was yeah. going to be yeah, that, that yeah. part. And yeah. in fact, he sprained an ankle or... And Stanley came up with this brilliant idea of Slim Pickens, somebody he knew yes. in uh, California, and he got him over, you see. Yes. And then we had problems to get him accepted by the unions and so on. And I had built this gigantic full-size Bombay on mm. the B-50 mm. and, and suspended it uh, from the grid of the big stage at Chapman. But I didn't have a practical bomb door, you see. And so... I was in trouble because then they asked me that he has to shoot in the three days or something like that. And I said, I can't do it, you know, in that time. Even if I work everybody day and night, uh, we can't get it done. That I had a wonderful special effects man that, uh, who worked with me before and uh, who was then already in his early 70s and he was called Wally Weavers. And uh, when I was in trouble, I always went to Wally Weavers. And Wally Weavers always used to say, Ken, let me sleep on it, and tomorrow I come up with a solution. And so what he did, we took a still of the inside of the bomb bay, which was enormous, and then he cut out where the bomb, bomb doors would be. And we shot it partly against blue backing and uh -huh. so on. And the actual missile complex was painted by a scenic artist called, uh, who eventually went to Disney. Mm -hmm. And so you have, and we suspended the, the bomb and then uh, pulled back and eventually optically uh, went see. in on the missile. And that's, that's what gives it this yeah. Very strange, Pain rather strange, frightening, yeah. uh, frightening feeling, yeah. feel. Yeah. Well, we've we've come to the end, but I, before before I leave you, I wondered, 
whether you have any pearls of wisdom for any young designer wanting to emulate your career in the, in the world of, of film production design? No. Uh, I don't know. I think um, they have to be able to assert their personality because you have to deal with a lot of, you know, with the director, with the cameraman and so on. And you have to be able also to dream, you know, and try and convince the director or producer if you feel there are some changes required or there are some new things you can introduce into the script. And so you have to have that personality. You obviously have to have talent and, and courage. Well, I, I like that notion of, uh, of dreaming. You've yeah. Obviously, many of your dreams have come to fruition and they're fantastic too. Uh, Ken Adam, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>